everyone. It's just a joy to have you here. I love hearing the buzz, people loving and caring about each other. It's a special place here at Peace. We exist here at Peace uh, to bring real peace to real people through Jesus Christ. And when we come into the presence of God, that's what we're here to do. When God's people gather in his presence to hear his word, Jesus makes a promise. He says that, that where two or three are gathered in his name, there he is. So we believe that Jesus is here with us right now to minister to you. Today, we're in a season of the church year called Epiphany. And in the season of Epiphany, we're thinking about the different ways that God reveals himself to us. And we're going to see today that God reveals himself to us, that he's a blesser of us even when we feel cursed, even when there's sufferings or troubles in our lives. You're going to see how God takes bad things and he makes them into good things. We just heard a song about that. We're going to sing another one in just a second. My name is uh, Pastor Jonathan Borman. For those of you who don't know me yet, uh, we have a, a student uh, pastor here. His name is Vicar Ethan Schultz. He's going to be delivering the sermon today, talking about how we can be a blessing to others when they curse us. And so you have a lot to look forward to here in this service. I want to invite you right now to join in singing a song as we think about this God who enters into our brokenness and the things that feel wrecked in our life to be uh, to be God for us, to be Jesus for us. Please join us if you feel comfortable.
What an act of faith to be able to bring brokenness into the presence of God and believe Him that He can take something like that and make it beautiful. I want to invite you into the presence of God to, to believe that, to trust that, and to lay on Him your sins and your brokenness. And we have some words we call this opening responses of sin, sin and grace to help you do that. Please stand and you can follow along on our screens. We begin with the words with which Christians are baptized in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father, we praise you that you have revealed yourself to us in your Son. We praise you that you have revealed yourself as a holy and gracious God. We ask, Lord, that you reveal yourself again as we consider how to love others as you have loved us. The scriptures say this, Blessed are they whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Almighty and merciful Father, we have strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed what we have devised and desired in our hearts. We have offended you and sinned against your holy law. We have done those things that we should not have done. And we have not done those things that we should have done. Have mercy on us, Lord. Spare us, forgive us, and restore us according to your promises in Christ Jesus. God, our merciful Father has forgiven all your sins. He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Redeemer and Savior. Jesus paid the penalty for our guilt by His death on the cross and freed us from death by His resurrection from the grave. We have peace with God now and forever. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord Help, save Comfort and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. This time you're invited to um, take in and sing in as you feel comfortable this beautiful song with so many promises from God, Psalm 62. Faint within when the dark. 
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, keep your family continually in true faith so that those who rely only on the hope of your heavenly grace may be protected by your mighty power through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Here at Peace, we want to bring a strong Christianity to today's people, and because that's true, we read three lessons, three parts of Scripture. We start in the Old Testament today. We're reading a lesson here from Genesis chapter 45, and here we see that God takes the, what seems to be a curse in Joseph's life. He gets, he gets sold into slavery by his own family and turns it into something beautiful and saving. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now, do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there has been famine in the land and for the next five years, there will be no plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then... It was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh, Lord, to his entire household and ruler of all Egypt. Now, hurry back to my father and say to him, this is what your son Joseph says. God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me. Don't delay. You shall live in the region of Goshen and be near me, you, your children and grandchildren your flocks and herds, and all you have done. I will provide for you there, because five years of famine are still to come. Otherwise, you and your household and all who belong to you will become destitute. You can see for yourselves, and so can my brother Benjamin, that it is really I who am speaking to you. Tell my father about all the honor accorded me in Egypt and about everything you have seen, and bring my father down here quickly. Then he threw his arms around his, father, his brother Benjamin and wept. And Benjamin embraced him, weeping. And he kissed all his brothers and wept over them. Afterward, his brothers talked with him. This is God's word. We're thinking about this theme of blessings and curses. And our psalm for today is Psalm 32. It gives you a chance to think about that a little bit more.
gotten one of the high points of the service. It's always such a joy to hear about the life and the work of Jesus. We have a distinct privilege today to hear one of Jesus, a part of one of Jesus' most famous sermons. This is called the Sermon on the Plain, at least a part of it. And here Jesus is teaching us again about blessings and curses. I want to invite you to please stand out of respect for the words and the works of Jesus. Our gospel for today comes from Luke chapter 6. Here's what he teaches us. But to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks you. And if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners, expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies. Do good to them and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great. And you will be children of the Most High because He is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. This is the gospel of our Lord. Please be seated. At this time, uh, we are going to join in singing the hymn of the day, a beautiful Christian hymn uh, called Renew Me, O Eternal Life. The portion of scripture that I'd like to share with you this morning comes from Romans chapter 12. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. 
Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil but overcome evil with good. This is God's word. I must have been only seven or eight years old, but I've never forgotten it. I was lying on the carpet floor of my grandma's house, and there was a TV show on. The show was documenting this massive wildfire the kind of wildfire that tears through grasslands at 15, 20 miles per hour even. And there were two men right in the path of this fire. And they did the most backwards thing ever. Instead of running, they stopped and they started a fire. They, they burned a patch in the grass and, and after they managed to put out that smaller fire they laid down right in the middle of that burnt patch. And as the wildfire raged through, the two men lived. And so now whenever I hear about a wildfire on the news, I always think about that story. It's stuck in my mind just because of how backwards it is, how how different it is from anything that I'd ever think to do in a situation like that. But backwards isn't bad. In fact, in that situation, it was actually life-saving. This morning, I want to show you something that you'll hopefully never forget. Something that's backwards. Something that's life-giving. This morning, I want to show you Christian community. And how it's countercultural through the people that it connects and through the people that it cares for. Christian community is countercultural through the people it connects. Paul is going to give us a look at this Christian community in Romans chapter 12. The first 11 chapters, Paul lays out this beautiful summary of Christian doctrine. He talks about justification and grace. And faith. And now in chapter 12, Paul transitions. He, he builds on that beautiful gospel foundation and he tells us about the life that we now get to live in view of all of God's mercy. But what Paul has for us this morning, it's, it's more than just moral standards to live by. Because when he says to live in harmony with one another and to associate with people even of a lowly position. He's not just saying to be kind, nice people. What he is doing is he's opening our eyes to real community, something that we all desperately need. I want you to imagine for a minute that you're in a large room. There are hundreds of people in this room. And there are a hundred tables with with chairs around each one. All you need to do is find one empty chair. But if you choose the wrong chair, it could be one of the worst decisions of your life. The atmosphere in the room is that cutthroat. Where you sit says a lot about you. And so you're, you're looking for an empty chair, you're scanning the room, and you see there's, there's a lot of empty chairs in the back, but you notice that the people sitting there seem to be a little bit different, and, well, you don't want to be known as different, so you keep looking. Everyone is watching, waiting to see where you're going to sit. 
where will you sit in the high school cafeteria? Now, hopefully this doesn't trigger too many bad memories of anyone's first day in high school. Maybe, maybe I exaggerated a little bit, but you know that at that age, the social atmosphere can be cutthroat. Who you talk to, who you eat with, all of that sort of factors into your popularity. And the, the popular, they hang out with the popular, and the, the not-so-popular hang out with the not-so-popular. But do we leave that mindset behind at high school graduation? Or are we still living in that cutthroat atmosphere? How selective are we when it comes to the people in our lives? Maybe it's, it's not around a lunch table anymore, but you get a notification on your phone. So-and-so wants to become your friend. Ignore. Or so-and-so says something that you don't really agree with, so unfriend. It's that easy. Or, or maybe it's not just social media, but the demographics in your neighborhood. They've been changing over the years, and still nice people moving in, but after a couple of months, the for sale sign goes up in the front yard. Our culture can be brutally selective with choosing the people, the friends in our lives. And more often than not, we try to stay away from the people at the bottom. Jesus took that culture and he flipped it upside down. Everyone was watching, just waiting to see where Jesus would sit. And Jesus was, he was popular enough that he probably could have sat just about anywhere. But he sat with the people who are different. He sat with the people at the bottom of the bottom. The prostitutes, the tax collectors, the, the people with contagious disease, people with demons. And people notice this and they ask, Jesus, why are you, why are you eating with those sinners? Where you sit says a lot about you. Jesus was breaking down the walls, the dividing walls of society. And instead of choosing the friends that he felt he needed, he chose the people who needed a real friend. And here we are this morning, people who all needed a real friend. It is so backwards, so backwards why he chose us. But Jesus, he, he broke down the, the dividing walls of sin so that he could be friends with us. And, and we, who, we who gather at the Lord's table, we're quite the bunch, aren't we? I say that with a smile on my face, but we all bring certain things to the Lord's table, our own backgrounds, our own mistakes, our own regrets, our own sin, all of that we bring to the Lord's table. But being at the Lord's table says a lot about who we are. It says that we're a part of God's family. We're a part of God's community. And so now we really get to live life. And it's, it's so much more than just watching people's lives on a screen. It's going out into the real world and living life with people. It's not unfriending and, and unfollowing these profiles, but it's living in harmony with, with one another, no matter how popular that person may or may not be. And so that means little things like waving to the person you wouldn't normally wave to. It means inviting someone out for dinner, not just because you want to have a good time, but maybe because that person needs a good friend. This is the life that Christ would have us live. Not just because it's our responsibility, but because it's a joy. Christ has given us so much more than a like button to click. He's given us these deep, raw emotions that we can connect with other people, laughing with them and, and crying with them and, and rejoicing with them. 
All of these things to bring us together with real people. And so that we don't have to hide behind those filtered photos. But we can live life with people, sharing our our real stories and our real struggles. This is pretty countercultural right now. Sharing life together at this level, and especially with people who are different. But it's life giving. Christian community is countercultural that way through the people that it connects. And so far, we've especially been thinking about those people who, who need a real friend, people who are looking for authentic, genuine community. But we need to push the boundaries even further than that. Because what about the people whom we've tried to become friends with, but they've quickly turned enemies? What about those people? Christian community is also countercultural through the people that it cares for. Paul describes what this Christian community looks like in the real world. And it's, it's a pretty tall order. When Paul says to be careful to do what is right in the sight of everyone, or when he says, as long as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. There's not a lot of wiggle room there. Everyone, whether we want to believe it or not, means everyone. It means our enemies. It means the people who have gone personally out of their way just to hurt or harm us in some way. Paul knows exactly what we'd like to do to those people. And it's probably not caring for them and and cooking them a nice, warm meal. But Paul says, do not take revenge. We hear that to not take revenge, and we might have to hold back a sigh of frustration because We know how sweet revenge can feel. People can't get enough of the stuff. People love watching a good movie with revenge in it. People later tonight are hoping to see some revenge on the football field, right? A hard hit is met by a harder hit. People just love that stuff. And so to hear that in our relationships we're not supposed to get even with people, that sounds like bad news. That sounds like we're, we're losing, like we're missing out on this really good thing. But when God says, it's mine to avenge, and I will repay, that is good news. Because we don't need to worry about getting even with someone, because when God is in control, he always comes out on top. And so we're not wasting our time and energy trying to think, how can I get even with that person? Instead, we get to use that same time and energy to care for people, to care for the people who have hurt us. It's a tall order. But Paul's not alone on this one. We heard Jesus' sermon earlier in the gospel reading. He says the same thing, love your enemies. And did Jesus ever love his enemies? He practiced exactly what he preached. He loved his enemies in the most unbelievable ways, caring for them in the deepest way possible by revealing himself, by revealing himself as their savior. You think about some of Jesus' enemies. You've got the Pharisees. They had felt so threatened by Jesus' popularity and by his preaching that they had plotted to kill him. But Jesus, he takes the time to have a conversation with one of those Pharisees by the name of Nicodemus. And he tells Nicodemus all about spiritual life. Years later, Nicodemus the Pharisee was reverently carrying the body of his Lord to the grave. Jesus cared for his political enemies, too. The Roman centurion that was overseeing Jesus' execution. This execution was was different from any of the others that he had seen. 
th this man was, he wasn't cursing the soldiers who were inflicting torture upon him, but he was blessing them. And so Jesus cared for this political enemy of his, this Roman centurion, by making sure he saw it all happen. That centurion saw Jesus hanging there on the cross, surrounded by thick darkness. And that centurion felt the earth shake as Jesus breathed his last. And seconds later, do you know what that centurion said? He said, surely this was the Son of God. Jesus also cared for a man who was personally going out of his way to hurt and to kill his family of believers and evangelists. A man by the name of Saul of Tarsus. Perhaps one of the greatest enemies of the early church. But Jesus cared for him in the deepest way possible. By revealing himself on the road to Damascus. And here we are this morning reading this man's words. The words of the Apostle Paul. Paul knew just how backwards everything was that God would choose him. That God would care for him. That God would love him in such a deep way. And so that's why Paul is writing this letter to us. He wants us to know that God cared for all of his enemies. Even you and me. Now you, you might be thinking... Well, those guys were God's enemies. They really had it out against him. But I've never had anything against God. When we start to have thoughts like that, we need to take a step back from what culture has been saying for years. That we come into the world with, with a blank slate and that we're just sort of neutral. But you know there's nothing neutral about the way you've treated enemies or even friends. And there's certainly nothing blank about the stain and, and the filth of sin that we came into this world with. Paul writes about that earlier in the letter to the Romans. He writes, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. We were God's enemies, but we were reconciled. Our relationship changed from being his enemies to being his sons and his daughters. And even that is so much better than a blank slate. That is a relationship with the Heavenly Father. So much change from enemies to dearly loved children. And here we all are this morning. In view of God's mercy, we've been set free from the patterns of the world when it comes to how we treat people, with how we treat our enemies even. And all of God's commands, they, they, even though we might not understand the reason behind them, they're perfect. And so when he says, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. We gladly listen. Whatever need that our enemy has, we care for them and we love them. We go against what culture says and we love the people who have hurt us. We care for the people who have robbed us of joy. It takes a miracle to do that. But it's the same miracle that's been worked in our lives. So this, this command from God to love your enemies, it's perfect. We wouldn't even need to understand the why behind it. But there is a why. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Now, that does sound a little bit strange. That sounds like a pretty sweet way to get revenge, to throw burning hot charcoal in someone's face. But Paul means something completely different when he quotes this proverb. And in order for us to sort of pick up this imagery, we need to imagine a culture that existed before electricity, before gas fireplaces that you could just flip on with a switch. 
Imagine with me for a moment, it's an early, cold morning. There's a knock on your door, and it's your neighbor. Not the nice, friendly neighbor that lives across the street, but the mean, grumpy, cruel neighbor that lives next door. His fire went out last night, and he needs help. And so even though this guy's been a real jerk to you for 10, 12 years, you go back inside and to your own fire, and you shovel some coals, and you take them back to your neighbor, and you put them in this clay dish that he's brought over. And as your neighbor takes this this dish of coals, and as he turns to leave, he's putting it over his head to carry it, he looks at you, and he thanks you. Loving your enemies. It seems so backwards. But what do you think that that neighbor's thinking about as he's walking back in the cold with those warm coals above him? He knew he didn't deserve it. And I don't think he would soon forget that kindness. And you wonder, maybe, just maybe, is that the beginning of of a new relationship, a new friendship in which one man can care for his neighbor in the deepest way possible by revealing Christ. And so what seemed so backwards, helping that unfriendly neighbor start a fire, it was more than just good. It was life-saving. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we stand in amazement that you have chosen us to be your friends. We ask that you fill our hearts with genuine love for people, with people of all sorts. And Lord, we ask that you fill our hearts with forgiveness and compassion for our enemies so that we can share with them the life-saving truths of your gospel. It is in your name we pray. Amen. Please stand as we confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. You may be seated for our offering. At this point, if you, if you had filled out one of these connection cards with any sort of information you'd like to share, feel free to place these in the offering baskets. Um, but if you don't have time to do it now, feel free to do it at the end of the service as well.
We've been blessed by the Lord, and the Lord calls us to bless others. One of the great ways, one of the primary ways we can do that is by praying for them. And this is our time in worship every week when we have a chance to play, pray for all people everywhere. We call this the prayer of the church. So please do stand, and we have prayers that you can follow on our screen this morning. O oh Lord, your servant Joseph endured hardship and struggle, yet believed it would come to good. Give us such tested faith and bring all things to completion according to your purposes in Christ, the new Adam who has brought hope to the world. Lord, in your mercy, lead all pastors, missionaries, and church workers in faithful service to your people with compassion and love. Bless every place where we hear your word and serve our neighbor in Christ's name. Lord, in your mercy. Help all parents who have brought their children to Christ in the waters of holy baptism, also to bring them to him faithfully in worship services, that he may continue to take them in his arms and bless them through his word. Lord, in your mercy. Let your love have its way with us, Lord. Lead us to expect no self-interested reward, but to love our enemies and serve those in need. Put an end to all bitterness and strife. Let forgiveness reign between each of us, even as Christ's blood covers our sins before your heavenly throne. Lord, in your mercy, uphold civil authority and those responsible to you for the welfare of our nation, state, in community. Help them steadfastly to pursue the cause of justice and protect life from beginning to natural end. Guard all first responders and protect those who defend us here or abroad. Lord, in your mercy. Comfort all who suffer. Deliver the sick according to your will and sustain by your grace those troubled in body or soul. Be with the dying. Grant them peace at last. Give your comfort to those who grieve. Grant your children patience and courage to endure every time of trial with hope in Christ. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, Heavenly Father, you bring all things to completion according to your order and time. When Christ comes and all the dead are raised, number us, we pray, among the saints in glory clothing the perishable with the imperishable, and bringing us into eternal life through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, and forever. And we join in praying the prayer you taught us, Lord. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another and serve the Lord with gladness. And go with this. We can go and make it our joy and our effort to bless others because we are confident that the Lord is on his mission to bless us. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Let's join in our closing song. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. 
Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. We live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes and wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. And holy, there is no Please be seated. Oh, I do pray that you are encouraged, that you are touched by the word of the Lord today and the encouragement of your fellow Christians. I know I was this morning. Here's some things to help you connect to, to peace here coming up. If you are a guest here with us, a warm welcome to you. And we could connect with you if uh, further, if you'd like, if you leave a connection card with us. It, it looks like this. It's perforated at the bottom of your service card. 
And if you want to just fill that out, we have blue bins in the back um, on both sides of the doorway of the sanctuary. If you'd like to leave that there with us, it would help us follow up with you and, and pray for you however you want us to, to care for you. We'd love to do that. Here's some things that are coming up here at Peace. We do have an opportunity called Supper and Study for Gathering. People come, um, they bring food. It's a potluck-style thing, um, and it's followed by Bible study at 6.30 p.m. So dinner's at 6, and then uh, uh, Bible studies at 6.30. We've been looking at Old Testament Bible stories. Everybody's welcome to come to that. Also, um, this Thursday at 6 p.m., uh, men are getting together at Shane's Rib Shack, you can let Dick Krajewski know if you'd like to attend. If you can just put your hand in the air, he's right back there. You can make him feel awkward. There he is. You can sign up with him, talk to him, let him know that you're coming. Also, right after, we're not even quite done. If you want to stick around this morning, I'm going to be doing a teaching this morning, and I promise I'll quit at noon. I promise I'll quit at noon. We'll start, let's say, let's start a little bit after, quarter after, to use the bathroom, catch up with people, grab coffee, donuts, whatever, bring them back in. And we're going to do a Peace Academy this morning um, where I'm going to be doing a teaching on spiritual conversations, having spiritual conversations with people. I'm very excited to do this. We haven't done this, actually had Bible class after worship since before the pandemic. So it's been, a, it's a, we're starting this up again, and we'd love to have you stick around and join us for that brand new teaching here this morning. Uh, finally, Ash Wednesday is coming up. Ash Wednesday is a very historic Christian service where we have a chance to prepare our hearts and lives um, as we enter the season of Lent and we begin to anticipate Easter. So Ash Wednesday is obviously on a Wednesday. It's March 2nd. Please mark your calendar for that. We're going to have a soup supper here at 5.30 p.m., and then worship is going to be at 7. If you'd like to help support that event, we do need people um, to sign up for various things. You can find that sign-up sheet in the Welcome Center on the right as you head out the doors. So thank you all for being here. I do pray that you encourage. Stick around for spiritual conversations in about 10 to 12 minutes if you'd like. Everybody have a great day.